Ladies and gentlemen, introducing Dr. Barbara Kreisman, Associate Dean of the Department of Executive Education and Working Professional MBA Programs. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to our Voices of Experience speaker series. This is the fifth out of six of these events this year. We have one more with Gary Kelly of Southwest Airlines on May 15th, and we hope that you return for that Voices of Experience event as well. Okay, so how many of you in the audience are boarders? Raise your hand. How many of you are skiers? Raise your hand. Ooh, a little competition here. Okay, this question will throw you. How many of you would prefer to go ice fishing rather than skiing or boarding? Nope. Well, if you were raised in Wisconsin like I was, that's what you would expect. So, but that's not the business these folks are in, so we won't go there. We are lucky to have several of the world's most spectacular ski resorts right here in our state. Breckenridge, Keystone, Vail, and Beaver Creek. Rob Katz, our speaker tonight, is the CEO and chairman of Vail Associates, and we can't wait to hear from him. Before I bring him on stage, however, I want to recognize the generous contributions of our sponsors who make these events possible. Our financial sponsors are U.S. Bank, Grant Thornton, Chase, First Bank, CoBank, Financial Executives International, and the Daniels Executive and Professional MBA programs. Our in-kind sponsors are the National Association of Corporate Directors, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, the Marketing Roundtable, Net Impact, and Bull Moose Productions. Bull Moose Productions comprised of a couple of our executive MBAs who helped make some of our videos that precede these sessions, and it sounds like something straight out of Vail. Okay, so how would you like to work for an organization described as a world premier mountain company, a leader in luxury destination, base travel, at iconic locations, and where your product is described as the great outdoors. Further, how would you like to brag to your friends that your company's mission is to provide the experience of a lifetime? Sounds pretty good. As CEO and chairman of the board for Vale Associates, that's exactly what Rob Katz has the pleasure of doing every single day. Since this series is referred to as the Voices of Experience, I want to give you a little bit of background on Rob, and he'll share much more with you. He'll tell you his own story. Rob was appointed chairman of the board of directors of Vail Associates in 2009, after having been named CEO in 2006. I do understand, though, that his first time down Vail Mountain was in 1990 after graduating from college on the East Coast. Prior to joining Vail Associates, Rob enjoyed, everything is relative here, enjoyed a previous stint on Wall Street with Apollo Management LP, a private securities and investment management company. After 9-11, however, Rob and his wife chose to move to Colorado to raise their sons. He is described by his associates and analysts as sharp, smart, innovative, and aware. They say his ability to both be a detailed-oriented person and manage the big picture has created much success for the company. Rob's commitment to drive financial results and to do so in an environmentally responsible way. His priorities have been strategic growth, international tourism, and environmental sustainability, a value that Daniels holds very dearly. So now, from Wall Street to the ski slopes, let's have Rob tell us in his own words why people should come to Colorado to enjoy the environment rather than to take a cruise or spend a weekend in Paris. Please join me in welcoming Rob Katz to Daniels. Thank you.
So we weren't going to announce this for a little while, but um, next week we'll be announcing that Vail Resources is going into the ice fishing business. <laughs> we will be opening locations across the northwest of our country. I was actually looking for a good joke on April 1st. That's about as good as you can get. How many people here have skied at one of our resorts at some point? Good. Friendly audience. But how many people here think that we charge too much for our products? <laughs> OK. I'm going to be talking about candor in just a little bit. And that was an excellent example of that. Um, so I'm actually going to give a little bit of a chat on uh, leadership and maybe my experiences um, and what I've taken away from uh, being on Wall Street and mostly being at Vail Resorts, where I think um, my people skills, <laughs> I think, have improved just a tad over uh, what they were like on Wall Street. Um, so, but I'm not going to talk a ton about the company, but in the Q&A session that follows, I'd be happy to answer questions, obviously, on me and my background on what I'm talking about here or, or our prices. <laughs> Only one question, though, on the prices. Um, let's get started. So if you know nothing about me by the end of this chat, what you should know is that for most of my life, I never told the truth. That is a shocking revelation and absolutely true. So now you don't know whether it's true or not. <laughs> <laughs> what do I mean? Um, well, as Barbara said, and I really appreciate that introduction, Barbara, um, and really appreciate DU for hosting this series. Before I even get into my own background, this series has been an incredible uh, contribution, I think, to the Denver community in total. Uh, and my hat's off. I, I'm thrilled just to be included with a lot of the speakers uh, that I know have been here before. But me, I grew up in New Rochelle, New York, which is about 20, 30 minutes north of Manhattan, and uh, wound up going to school um, on the East Coast at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I had a real affinity for math and science, and so when I applied to the University of Pennsylvania, I applied to the engineering school. After one year in the engineering school, I quickly switched to business. Why? Business is much easier than engineering. I learned, <laughs> I learned that quite quickly. Um, you know, I, I think the reason why I switched was, as much as I liked the analytical part of math and science, I really was looking for some kind of personal connection. And I actually found that business was an opportunity to try and marry both of those skills together. And so wanting that personal connection, I went to the most obvious place where you could get it, which was Wall Street. Um, on Wall Street, they say, if you want a friend, buy a dog. And, and I would say that, that that's actually not far from the truth. Um, there is very little um, on Wall Street uh, that, that is really focused on, on personal development. But I'd be remiss if I didn't say that my time on Wall Street gave me incredible skills and strengths to be a leader today like making a decision, understanding risk, and understanding the numbers and how you raise capital. I mean, those are critical parts of making a successful company. And I do think that when I look at you know, some of the opportunities that I have today, I think it absolutely came from um, building those building blocks, essentially, um, in being able to now lead a fairly large company, um, certainly that one that's traded on a public, you know, in the public markets. Um, I started. I started my career at an investment bank called Drexel Burnham. Uh, Drexel Burnham um, was a, an incredibly interesting and uh, fascinating place to work. And after a year and a half uh, of being there, the company went bankrupt. All 7,000 people, along with myself, were fired in one day. Uh, they ran into trouble with the law. I was only 21, so I didn't really have any issue with that. But I found myself without a job thinking that I'd wasted the first couple of years of my career, which, of course, when you're that age, you feel like is your whole career, which is true. Um, I then had the opportunity, though, to join a new firm called Apollo Management, as Barbara mentioned. Uh, and this was a newly started private equity firm. Uh, and it was a huge opportunity for me because I got a chance as a very young, per as a very young person 
to have responsibility, to have oversight over companies and investments that we made, and to start learning about business from an incredible perch. And I was convinced when I started at a very junior position that the most important thing, the thing that would make me happiest in my life, would be to become a senior partner at that firm. So in 1988 or 1989, 1999 I think it was, I became a senior partner in that firm and realized that that was a disaster. That the, <laughs> the people that I, were par I was partners with, I love them to death, they're still all there, um, were not necessarily who I wanted to have as my work family for the rest of my life. So I sat back and said, I want to make a change. I want to do something different, and I don't want to be someone who has spent their entire career in one place. So my wife and I started talking about where it is that we wanted to move to, and I was fortunate enough on many, many counts, but on this one too, that uh, my wife Alana was up for the adventure. And we actually sat back, I was fortunate enough to have some uh, financial flexibility when I was at uh, Apollo, and so we decided to look around the country for where we would want to move to that would be the greatest place on earth to live and raise our kids. That turned out to be right here in Colorado, actually in Boulder, not in Denver. Um, and it was a sea change, really the most monumental thing that I did uh, certainly in my whole life to date. Uh, moving to Boulder, I left Apollo, worked for them a little bit part-time, uh, and then spent three or four years on my own finding myself. In 2006, I became CEO of Vail Resorts and have been in this position ever since. But when I look back, it was those three to four years of my life that really wound up changing my perspective both on who I am and on leadership and how to lead people. Because it was during that time that I started to focus on how do you develop relationships with other people? And I started to realize how important that was and how interested I was in that. So I actually let, uh, you know, sent myself out on a little bit of an exploration, did all kinds of things, which in Boulder means you're doing all kinds of crazy things, but ultimately settled on group leadership training. I wound up doing a number of courses and a number of experiential processes around how you lead and are effective in a group, not a group of thousands, a group of four people, five people, seven people. How can you be effective at leading that group? How can you be effective at making change? And what I learned through that process was that it is about making a personal connection with each and every individual who's next to you. And the only way to do that was by being candid. You had to have an open and candid dialogue. Candor is one of the most overused words in leadership and in development. What I realized very quickly was there were people in these groups that I was sitting with who I did not know at all, nothing. Had never met them before, had no relationship with them, they, didn't, they weren't work colleagues, they weren't family, no history. Shouldn't have mattered to me whether these people liked me, didn't like me, whether I was offending them or not. It was a great opportunity to experiment and what I realized on my first day was that I was completely petrified of being candid with them, telling them what I really thought, afraid of insulting them, afraid of you know, what they would think of me, afraid of 25 other things. And I realized very quickly that that's not just in these groups, but that I had trouble with candor for the better part of my life. I had trouble sitting with somebody and telling them a hard fact really good at making them happy, really good at trying to get them to like me, but telling them what's really going on, telling them how I really feel, completely not in my wheelhouse. So that led to a first realization. My first realization was, you can't lead thousands of people if you can't lead one person. What does that mean? What that means is that very often people think of leadership and being a CEO as making grand pronouncements, taking a megaphone and talking about all kinds of big ideas, when in actuality leadership is about a relationship. It's not a broadcast. It's about making a relationship between you and the person that you're leading in that moment. And I learned that during those three years and when I got to Vail, I decided that it would be my mission to try and take all these learnings 
and put them all into action. And I can tell you that the team of senior leaders that I had at the time, they were the worst for it. Because I decided that I was going to be candid with everybody. <laughs> I was going to tell the truth. Well, isn't that what you're supposed to do? You learn something new, you're going to go and you're going to put it into practice. So that's what I did. But, and there were challenges, and I'll go into some of them, but, what, but I really did take this away, and I think it's been actually the most important thing for me in the success that we've had at Vail, and we have had a lot of transitions at Vail, a lot of new things that we've done, a lot of company-changing events. But what I've made it my life work at Vail is to focus on the seven or eight people that report to me. Because if I focus on my relationship with them, and their relationship with each other, and we are aligned, then the rest of the company's success is actually the easy part. And too often, people think to themselves that they have trouble getting along with the people that work for them, or they have trouble trying to manage one, this person or that person, but that's not really important. What's important is what, what is the company's mission statement. And yeah, that is important. Nowhere near as important as making sure that you are aligned with who you have reporting to you because in the end of the day, it is them that are going to take your message and take your actions out to the field. And if they stay aligned with you, there's almost nothing you can't accomplish. That led to another realization. How can you be good at creating this relationship with all of these people who report to you? And what I took away was the only way that you can be good at that is if you have an understanding of yourself, which is another trap that I certainly fell in many, many times and other people fall in, which is you can't lead other people unless you know yourself, unless you've done your own work, unless you've built some self-awareness. And I've kind of come up with a phrase, the Six Sigma of you. Six Sigma, for those who don't know, was a process, I think that started with in, uh, Motorola, it was back in the early 80s, and then really popularized by um, Jack Welsh at GE. And this process was about how to reduce costs in manufacturing. And it was very, very popular at the time and really drove a lot of success within the United States in terms of removing manufacturing defects and a constant focus on always improving every single part of your company. It really was this I think first popularization of the kind of continuous improvement which we now see across a lot of the country. And I, I'm a huge fan of it and I think it's amazing and I think it's absolutely the right thing for any company to take on. But what I do think sometimes gets missed is that this should start with you. That if you want to be an effective leader, you have to do the work on yourself first. And the same level of intensity and improvement that you try and take to all these parts of the business, all the things you kind of tell everyone else in your company to do, should probably start with you. And so for me, what I feel like I've tried to do at Vail and, and learned a little bit before joining was constantly trying to get feedback about what I'm like, what I'm doing well, what I'm not doing well. Whether that's through personality tests, whether that's through 360 reviews, whether that's through constantly begging all of the people on your team and everybody in the company to try and give you some candid feedback because as a leader, and of course the more senior your leadership becomes, it's really hard to get that kind of feedback. One of the other great places that you can get this kind of feedback I have found is by having a good spouse who is, <laughs> who is willing to give you critical feedback. Another possibility is your mother who also might be willing to give you critical feedback. And in my case, my success is mostly due to the fact that I have both. <laughs> it, it, no, it really is. It's, I think it's one of the biggest challenges that people find, right? How do you create, right, these kind of, um, how, how do you make sure that as you look out towards your people, as you're creating impacts, every time you open your mouth, people are watching you to see how they should act and react. If you don't have a handle on who you are, it is going to be awfully tough for you to be successful. Every single one of your foibles, every single, every single one of the, of the problems and insecurities and issues that you have 
get magnified. And also at a company, one of the things, and this was probably the biggest thing that I you know, didn't think I, ex I, I ex would expect to have happened when I decided to become the CEO of Val, is that everyone in the company also puts their projections on you. This is true for any leader, not just being CEO. Right? They, their hopes, their dreams, their issues, their worries, their concerns, people put that on the leader that they're looking to. Look, just, <laughs> look at what we do to our president. But it is really essential that you are comfortable with who you are if you're going to be able to react and act in an appropriate and fair way, given all of this pressure that people put on you. So to me, I absolutely think leadership, again, begins with relationship. To be in a good relationship, it has to start with you taking responsibility for yourself. The other piece that I think is critical is something, is range. And I think effective leaders, and I, I've certainly appreciated Barbara's comments earlier, be big and be small. One of the things that, that I found at Vail that, that I think I've, was disorienting when I first got there was the number of issues, problems, concerns, decisions it, it, that are constantly coming at you. And in a place like Vail Resorts, where we have, now we have nine ski resorts, there are so many, not only from your employees, from your guests, from regulators, from politicians, from shareholders, from investors, from analysts, there's so many things that are constantly coming at you that you can actually fall into a trap, and I have found myself in this trap on many different occasions, either running around and trying to solve every single little small problem, or detaching from all of these things and just sticking on the, the big issue. To me, I feel like Leadership is about doing both. It's about being able to scale between, at times, being big when you need to be, and at times, being small. And part of that is also how you relate to each and every person who reports to you and all the people you deal with in your company, which is sometimes you have to be big for them. Sometimes you have to literally set a tone. Sometimes you have to be that kind of larger-than-life figure somebody that they can look up to. And sometimes you've got to be admitting your mistakes. Sometimes you've got to be dealing with their small issues. You really have to play with range. The other thing that I tell people about with range, big and small, and even in other directions, is that ultimately people typically come in, especially at the senior levels, which is certainly what I mostly deal with at Vail Resorts. People come in having had great success using a particular style. So they come to Vail Resorts, and they're either very aggressive, and they're, they, they pound on people a lot, or they're very nice to people. They get along with everybody. Or they constantly ask questions, or they never speak up. Or there are tons of styles, and all of them actually can be quite successful. And what you find is people stick with those. It's worked for me. I'm not going to change. I don't want to take a risk, so I'm going to stick with it. And what I try and push myself and try and push my people to do is to play with other choices. Try something else on to make a difference. And it's not because I feel like if you're really good at being a questioner, you know, maybe being quiet is the right thing to do. But it's that I want to see that you have a choice. You're not defaulting to one type of leadership or another that you can play depending on the situation that you're in. For me, I actually just saw uh, the movie Lincoln. I assume a lot of people here have seen the movie. Great movie. Um, and I think when you watch the movie or read the book, um, A Team of Rivals, what you see in Lincoln is an incredible leader who is able to sit back and almost be, seem a little bit unattached. He tells stories. Everything in the country, I mean, we think we have troubles now. You can't even compare to when Lincoln was running the country. But no matter what, he literally had this incredible persona, a very light touch, but yet a ton of wisdom. I am nothing like that. <laughs> I am like the <laughs> jackrabbit that literally, you know, fires off, you know, gets upset, I have a ton of intensity, I have a, you know, run after this, run after that, get this done, get 20 things done. 
I, I look and feel nothing like what Lincoln looks like. But what I've tried to do for myself is say, not just with Lincoln, with others, is how can I pull back? Part of my maturity and my growing as a leader is learning how to breathe. <laughs> actually a very simple <laughs> process, but actually one that a lot of leaders, including myself, sometimes find it hard to do. Because you do, you have all this stuff going on around you. So pushing your range and pushing the range of your people can make a huge impact on giving people the skill sets to be successful and giving yourself the opportunity to then be supple. So when different situations come up, when problems happen at the company, you're able to react. One of the ways that I think our company actually really exhibited this and one of the proudest moments I've had at Bell Resorts um, was when the recession hit, uh, you know, the Great Recession. So um, the worst p moment of, of the recession actually was in March of 2009, right in the middle of the biggest month that we have as a ski resort. Um, that was when the stock market, I think, bottomed out at around 6,800 Dow Jones. Um, people at that moment, I mean, it's hard to, you know, now it's been so many years later, the world's kind of gone on, but at that point, people were really questioning whether um, anyone would go on a ski vacation anymore. <laughs> um, would anybody take a ski lesson anymore? Um, and it was a pretty scary moment. We sat around as a management team and tried to talk about all the different ways that we could react to that. And what I'm proud about is that, you know, most other people in travel were laying people off. It's because it's an obvious way to reduce costs, and if you're seeing less business, then you lay people off. It's quick, it's easy, not too hard to do in many respects, other than the personal side. But we pushed and churned as a team as to whether or not there were any other options. What we came up with was a way for us, we had a target of costs that we wanted to reduce and what we thought our board and what we thought our shareholders wanted to see. But instead of laying people off, we had the entire company take a wage reduction. So we wound up not executing any layoffs at all. It was a huge risk on two fronts. One was, I wasn't quite sure how the market would react to that. They might see the wage reduction as unsustainable and that we, weren't real, you know, we were not willing to make the tough choices. But more importantly, I was really worried about how our employees, including our senior management team, would react to something like that. What happened actually was it was an incredible ra rallying cry because everybody and the senior people took the biggest wage reductions by far. But, but, but most importantly, it was that everybody felt all of a sudden like we were in this together, like we were going to ride out this storm together, and I would say the company has never been as aligned, as committed. Our mission has never been more clear since we did that. And I do, you know, it's, it's, is, that, is that leadership? Is that ingenuity? Is that problem solving? I, I look at it as range. It's that we practiced even before this day of pushing and pulling each other to try and come up with new ideas and not getting stuck. It's all personal. The funniest thing to me is that almost every company, and I'll include ours, says that our most important assets are our people. Um, and in our case, actually, <laughs> labor is our biggest expense by far, uh, probably tenfold any other expense we have at the company. So in our case, it's really true. But I, I'm sure it's true for, for many companies out there. And yet, people forget that if your biggest asset, most important asset is people, sometimes people forget that probably means everything you do is personal. Every decision you make, every encounter you have, every single person on your team, every single person who works at the company will view things in a very personal way. And at Vail Resorts, we actually have an incredibly social culture. One of the things, if you ask people, well, how do you create, you know, we have a culture that's, that's, that's very focused on results, but we don't, we don't get along enough, you know, well enough and we, we want to get more social. How do you, you know, you might ask a question, how, how do you make it more social? How do you do it? The number one piece of advice that you'll get is to create an activity that everyone does outside the company, right? Try and get people together outside of the work environment to build those relationships. Well, in our company, people ski, board, 
they ride their bikes, they hike, they mountain climb, and we have a very active, very outdoor-oriented company. It's incredibly social. Relationships are super important. And it is one of the things that I quickly, when I got there, you know, especially coming from, <laughs> from Wall Street, was shocked at. Everyone looks at everything that happens in a very, very personal way. And what I found was, you don't always hear and see it come to life. So you, what I noticed very quickly in a lot of the business meetings that I was having was that you would sit there and you talk about an issue, I don't know, something about the company or whatever it is that you were going to do, and you could, I could start to look around the room, and I was realizing that 90% of what people were feeling never gets said. Right? There's the things that you hear from your folks who report to you, there's the things that you watch in a meeting that you lead or that you're participating in, and then there's literally all the other reactions and things that are going on around you. And what I started to take away from was that this became more important sometimes than the content or the decision or whatever it was that we were discussing. That as a leader, looking around to my group or my people or wherever I was and trying to assess what was really happening, not saying anything, but just kind of listening for what was going on was going to be sometimes more important and more impactful than worrying about the content of a particular decision. Watching people's reactions, watching them after the meetings, watching them in the hallways, listening to the conversations on the ski hills, all of these things became actually way more important than what somebody said in a meeting. And what I started to realize was that this was something, probably, it's not, I'm sure it's not true just for Vail, I'm sure it's true for many, many companies, that focusing on that personal piece then, so for my team, my conversations with each one of the people who report to me does veer into the personal. What's going on for them? How are they doing? I started to spend about half of my time with each person who reported to me just on them. What are they going through? What are they feeling? How did they feel about the last meeting? For the first few years that I was at the company, didn't do that at all. I just assumed it would take care of itself. But over time, I started to realize that, no, actually, that was more important. <laughs> that hopefully, especially at the most senior places of a company, I'd hired people who could really do their job, and what they needed from me was guidance. Or they needed to vent at me or argue with me. They needed to thank me, criticize me, whatever it was. Going through a kind of personal process with each and every person so that they could leave you know, my office or they could move out from my relationship and absolutely deliver their best possible work. And as a leader, it's not just when you're a CEO, it's anywhere that you are in a company. I think that's a critical part of your job, as I said from the very beginning. You have to enable your people to do their best work and most of your time, in my case, 50 to 60% of my time is spent trying to work with each and every person and get them to play an incredibly big game. Risky. One of the things that I learned really early on at, on Wall Street was how to make a decision. And that when you make a decision, if, you, if there's the possibility that you're gonna have upside or something good might happen from that decision, very often, in fact, actually always, there's the possibility that something could go wrong. And in fact, if you don't think anything can go wrong, you're probably deluding yourself a little bit. And what I learned actually was the best skill that I took away from Wall Street, and, and I do think it's a challenge sometimes in corporate America, is leaders making decisions and being willing to live with the consequences of them going wrong. And I feel like at Vail, there's a lot of things that we've done. Some of them have gone incredibly well, some of them haven't. But I feel like when I go into them, I do feel like I understand that there's potential downside. The place that I ran into more trouble was on this personal piece. So as I started to feel like, well, I needed to be more personal with my people, I needed to help develop them, I needed to really push them, I started to push on the personal side as well. And what I quickly found was you can get some explosions. <laughs> That'd be... <laughs> 
When you push people on the personal side and the, you know, their identity is at issue and their dreams and their hopes and their concerns, when you start playing around and messing in that box, the reactions you get from people are much, much more intense than when you're just talking about you know, a particular accounting treatment or <laughs> marketing plan. You might disagree. It's never going to be the same level as when you're really talking about who somebody is. But I also found that that was the only way to make people better leaders. That if all you did was spend time talking about these, you know, what they're doing day in and day out, they may get better at that, they may hone those skills, but they will never become a better leader. That ultimately, and, we, and you hear this a lot when, when people talk about leaders, you hear people talk about the hero's journey. That great leaders are sometimes made because they've had to deal with some kind of trauma, they've had to deal or overcome with a setback, could be personal, could be business-wise, and because they went through that, that experience has allowed them to be an incredibly strong and effective leader. I think one of your functions as a leader is to, cause, to, is to create that hero's journey for people. Because one of the things that's, you know, that's a challenge, right? If, if, I, if I was sitting out there and I was thinking I was young and working for somebody and somebody said, well, if you have a hero's journey, you'll be a great leader. Well, look, how do you, <laughs> now what? You know, I, I don't want to create a tragedy <laughs> right? so that I can overcome and, you know, get sick or lose, the, lose a loved one or, or be lost in the wilderness for a week or, you know, I mean, but, but yet <laughs> those are the things you always hear from people as to how I, you know, became who I am today. But I think what you can do is by poking and prodding, by facilitating each of the people who reports to you, you can create, yeah, through a little bit of stress, which I'll talk about in a minute, you can create a little bit of that hero's journey, giving your people the opportunity to overcome, to actually become better leaders because they can deal with more and more experiences. I would say this. In trying to do this, very often you're wondering whether you're doing the right thing, whether you've pushed too far, whether all of a sudden <laughs> you know, your attempt to give somebody a hero's journey has <laughs> led them into a you know, total loss of confidence. So I would say this. It does start with building trust both in your team and, in, and them in you and you in yourself. And I do think that it's critical for anyone, anywhere, to have, if you're going to really you know, push and pull. And I, actually, I would say, one of the things when I think about being risky is think about a sports coach who we, you know, why our, our country idolizes sports, as do I, and we watch people. Like one of the things I know when I go to Nuggets games is I watch George Carl, who, when his players walk off the court, never says good job, never pats him on the back, never says anything, actually. And I'm sure he has, of course, he's an incredible coach, a method to that madness. And we watch coaches all over. Some of them go too far, that's true, but so many of them we see are so successful in motivating their players and pushing and pulling constantly on them, constantly creating that. We don't always do that in corporate America. And I'm not sure why, because it is actually an incredibly successful tool to motivate your teams. But if you're going to do that well, you need to have a mentor. You need to have someone who you can talk to and tell what it is you're doing, making sure you're on the right track, keeping your own ego and your own personality in check. So for me, I actually think I, I was fortunate in that those few years I had between when I was on Wall Street and then when I took the job at Vail, I got an opportunity to actually connect with a couple of people who I met through my travel, so to speak, who I have literally kept for now over a decade as mentors. And I use them to constantly hold me accountable, check in with what I'm doing with my people, and I think my job as a leader is to do the same thing for everybody who reports to me and their job for everybody else, and it's critical for anyone in any company to find somebody that you can check in with to keep you on the straight and narrow and allow you to play your biggest game and allow you to test and push and take risk, but know that you haven't gone too far. 
Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that is completely appropriate to be on a bump run. <laughs> <laughs> So when you ski bumps, um, and I think it is true, the first time I came out to Vail was, like, I think, yeah, 1990. Um, and I skied, I started skiing at Hunter Mountain, right outside of New York, when I was, I think it was 10 years old, and started skiing in the Northeast. When I got to Vail, I mean, for, for those of you who may have been here all your life, anyone coming from the Northeast who skied those kind of mountains, you get to Vail, you're like, oh, holy, you know, it's like this awe-inspiring. Uh, meanwhile, I've never actually gone back to the Northeast to ski. <laughs> uh, which is, given that I'm in the industry, probably not the right thing to say. But, I, but, but one of the things that I really was focused on when I was learning how to ski was how to ski bumps. And one of the, the key things when you're going through the bumps is you have to stay calm. And yet, there are literally these obstacles that are flying at you every two seconds. And you have to learn how to manage the rhythm and the flow. And you have to stay stable and stay balanced. It's the only way, you know, if you get too far back, if you're too nervous, if you're too scared, never do it. What I found in, in business, and, and certainly I think as in leadership, is that leadership is filled with tension. It is literally, you, you can't almost turn anywhere without seeing some kind of tension that you're being asked to resolve. And it really goes, runs the gamut. It can be you have environmentalists that are concerned about something that you're doing on one of the mountains. You care, like I do, about the environment. How do you resolve that? You're going through a recession. You want to protect your employees. You have shareholders that also expect to be taken care of. You have tensions in trying to, going all the way back to the beginning of my talk, you have tensions in trying to tell somebody who works for you that they just made a mistake or that they have something they're doing in their leadership that isn't working. You have tensions in taking somebody who you like very much personally, who you respect, but who isn't the right person for a job that you need to be taken to the next level, and you have to let them go. These tensions that you deal with day in and day out, I think one of the biggest challenges that leaders face is trying to resolve them too quickly. What you find is, is that, and I think, and we see this unfortunately off over and over again in the newspapers, leaders that um, resolve tension in inappropriate ways. Um, and, I, and I think it's, you know, I think a lot of times I think we sit back, we watch politicians, we watch CEOs, we watch athletes, we watch all these people and we say, well, you know, oh my God, they're terrible people, these are awful people, they're looking at what they're doing. And I think there's some, you know, of course, truth to that and, and, you know, I think everybody has a responsibility to behave in the right way. But I will say one of the learnings I had becoming a CEO is um, it's different. You know, the level of public pressure, private pressure, projections that people put on you, and I know certainly get put on our politicians, get put on athletes, super high. And the ability to sit with that and just let it sit there without trying to solve everything, I think is a critical and really important skill set. Now I talk about this a lot, and it's funny, I was, uh, 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 one of my direct reports, one of, one of the folks on my team was telling me that just a week ago or two weeks ago they ran into somebody who had seen me speak about a year ago, and, and this woman said to, to him, you know, I saw Rob speak, and I think he said the word tension like 25 times. My God, it must be so tense to work at Vail Resorts. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so now I'm going <laughs> to put out there that when I say the word tension, I don't mean tense. I'm not, I'm not saying that, <laughs> nobody's saying that you should, you know, that everybody's gonna walk around the company being tense. But I do think there's a real skill to sitting, sitting with it and not trying to move on it. And for me, one of the great, um, great practices that I did pick up, uh, which I now do on and off, but this was no better place to learn this than in Boulder, um, was meditation. Um, and 
you know, what I'd say is I, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to, you know, um, <laughs> you know give a, a Buddhist pep talk. But, but, uh, <laughs> but I would say that, you know, sitting, right, in one place for a minute, two minutes, five minutes, you start to realize how difficult <laughs> it really is to sit with tension. And in fact, um, I actually brought up to my team, we, we, our, our team does a lot of amazing things together to try and build camaraderie and push and pull each other, do all kinds of, we've done ropes courses, we've done rafting, we've done uh, hiking, and we've you know, brought in uh, God knows how many different facilitators, and you know, I'm, you know, they, they know me, you know, I'm always up for you know, the next best thing to try and get people off balance a little bit. And they're, everyone is totally up for it in a game until I said the word meditation. <laughs> then I thought I was going to actually lose half the team right there. <laughs> I, but I do. I think whatever it is that you find, it could be running, could be skiing, could, you know, but you have to, as a leader, and especially as you get more and more senior, living and sitting with tension is critical. That, to me, is where great ideas, innovation, new approaches come from, is sitting just a little bit longer with an unsolved problem, or sitting with someone in your office who you have to give a tough message to. Sometimes I actually feel like it's always hard when you have to let somebody go, but giving somebody a tough message who you know you have to work with going forward, that's tough. Sitting in that tension, it's incredibly powerful. And I, actually, one other, I guess, quick funny story on this was um, one of the things I used to talk to my team about was sitting in silence. Um, it's one of the hardest things to do, actually, in any meeting, in any context. And I recently gave a talk um, at the 40 Under 40. It was last year. And I, I went up on stage and started my talk, and I counted to 60 without saying a word. And then I started my talk and talked about tension and how uncomfortable that is and this and that. Anyway, when we were done, a woman um, who was in the audience came up to me and said, you know, I just have to tell you, I was so uncomfortable that I was about, I literally, if you had gone on one more second, I was going to run up on stage and save you. <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, how, how, how would that save me? What would you do? She said, I have no idea, but I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> and I, I do think it's a great example, though, right, of this piece. Final piece, rest. Don't coast. So I would say if you, if you asked anyone on my team, maybe anyone in the company, I'm not sure, but certainly the people who know me best, you know, they would say that I push, 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 and clearly one of my challenges is to rest. And so I, I actually formulated this because I, I get a lot of feedback from my team about, hey, it's, you know, it's hard to work for you, and, it, and, it's, and, and it's, you're engaging and you push us to do our best and everything else, but every now and then, you know, we do need to, to rest a bit. And I've started to realize that, you know, one of the things that I am on guard for, I think for myself, and I think this is true probably for any leader, if you have some success or a company when you're having success, and I certainly think right now Vail Resorts is in an amazing place. You really have to be on guard for coasting. <laughs> Feeling like your work is done. You've accomplished your goals, you are where you want to be, and now you can really sit back and just let the ride go. And what I would tell you is, is that this is a really human um, uh, you know, trait. Uh, I think that's how we're wired. And so I, I think for myself, I think as it relates to you know, the Six Sigma view and constantly trying to prove myself, I'm always on guard to let this happen and I'm constantly trying to make sure that our company never is asleep at the switch never lets others in our industry, even in the broader travel industry, try and get in front of us. So I've actually tried to think of this, though, but we are people. We're not machines, and we do need an opportunity to regenerate. And so what I've really come to is a, a view that find the time as a leader to rest, to check out, to watch whatever TV show you know, allows you to zone out, go to sporting events, drink, whatever it is. <coughs> Take that time off, but always remember you're not there to coast. Great companies are the companies that are constantly reinventing themselves, constantly striving to find that next idea, constantly looking 
to be out front of their competitors and all their, everyone in their industry. And that's the same thing for leaders. My job is to stay out in front of my team, not because I have to be better than them, it's that I have to be there to support them. I have to be constantly looking at myself and constantly improving myself, and yeah, I've got to be there for my team too. But every now and then, you absolutely have to take a little bit of a breather. Go up to Vail. <laughs> Keystone. <laughs> I mean, if I can make a shameless plug, I think I can. Um, Barbara talked about it, which is, you know, the, the mission of Vail Resorts is experience of a lifetime. Every single person in our company knows that what we are here on this earth at Vail Resorts to do is to provide every single guest an experience of a lifetime, of an iconic moment with their friends and family that they will remember for the rest of their lives. And the way we do that is by providing an experience of a lifetime to every single employee that works at Vail Resorts. Because when our people are having an experience of a lifetime, when they interact with our guests, that's where the magic happens. And I think many of you who have visited our resorts or probably worked at our resorts at some point know that. The passion and the ex exuberance that people have is incredibly infectious. Uh, and I, I would just close by saying I feel, you know, like the luckiest person you know, on the planet um, to get a chance to have my career with the most amazing, passionate, um, innovative, and, and game um, courageous people um, that I certainly have ever met in my life. Thank you. Questions? I'll only take one or two on price. <laughs> Could you tell us a story where you took a risk and it failed, and what happened, and how did you react to it? and not oh. let it impact you going forward. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to, what? Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, there, there are tons of them. Um, I think, um, I think, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. This will probably take a little longer, so I might crowd out other questions. But one of the m biggest challenges I had, actually, um, uh, mistakes probably I made as a leader, wound up on the, in the New York Times and the Denver Post. Um, and that was that uh, it was early in my tenure and social media had just come about. And uh, I tweeted from my house in Boulder that there was snow, tons of snow on the ground. Well, there wasn't any snow up in the mountains. It was the middle of October. And a reporter up in the mountains, who I actually knew, wrote a column the next day about how I was being totally disingenuous and hyping snow and how could I write about snow when there was no snow up there and blah, 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 blah. And I just flipped. I, was, I couldn't believe, first of all, I knew the guy and I was like, oh my God, how could this happen? And I was, you know, what, me, disingenuous? I'm just tweeting from my house, you know? So of course I picked up the phone like an idiot and called him and said, that was ridiculous. You didn't even call me to ask me about it. We didn't talk about it. And he would have none of it. Was furious, you know, that I'd even called him. So of course, like an even bigger idiot, I called his publisher, and I just was upset. I didn't ask for anything to have happen, I will say. But the next thing I find out is that this reporter was fired. He then runs around telling everybody that I got him fired because of this, which wasn't good, not at all. But I figured, you know, OK, whatever. It's up in the mountains. Who's going to know? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> So the Denver Post decides, of course, to write a column on this. And of course, because they felt threatened, it was media, and they were being blah, 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 blah. And literally, you know, I'm like, oh my god, what a disaster. And I was totally humiliated, and I was like, oh, this is like the worst thing that could ever happen. Until two days later, someone at the New York Times, David Carr, writes his own column on this topic. 
And I'm like, oh my God, like that's how I make it to the New York Times? <laughs> <laughs> so now what did I do about it? What I did about it was, um, first of all, I went to my team and sent them an email because uh, you know, we weren't all together at, in that moment. And I told them that I had made a huge mistake and that while you know, there were a lot of things being said in these articles that weren't true about me, um, that really didn't matter because I was an, a fool for having put myself in that position. And that was a pretty immature move and that I had brought a lot of, I mean, we spend a ton of time at Vail Resorts on PR, on making sure that the, the guests see us in a very positive light. And I had kind of thrown a lot of that out uh, in a nanosecond. Um, and so I, I did, I apologized to them, I apologized to a broader group, um, and I learned from it, you know, and now I never talk to the media. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, I think it's, that, but it's, part, it's part of me being the kind of anti-Lincoln, you know, where <laughs> I'm more apt to, you know, get all pissed off and blah, 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 you know, as opposed to being a little bit more um, wise. <laughs> Other questions? I had one, and this could help you, in, you know, to be less humble, and that's regarding Breckenridge. I've heard two neat stories, one peak six, and the other your summer expansion of activities. Could you enlighten us? Sure. Um, so uh, Breckenridge actually is, what's amazing about Breckenridge is that it is uh, perennially the number one or number two most popular mountain in the United States with Vail. They, they go back and forth one and two. But Breckenridge does it on half the terrain that, that, that Vail does. And what's amazing about Breckenridge, I think as we all know, is the town, which is just an incredibly rich old mining town that I, uh, people just love and they love the atmosphere there. Um, but about six or seven years ago, we started a process to expand uh, uh, Breckenridge, which currently operates on peak seven, eight, nine, and 10. We said we also wanted to operate on peak six, which was actually in our permit. So it's actually part of our Forest Service permit for skiing, but with the environmental process as it is today, it takes years, five, six years. And ultimately, we got it approved. This, I guess, the approval came in the last uh, three to four months. Um, and so, and, and there was some controversy around it. I think anytime you expand any of our mountains, there's always going to be a bit of controversy. Uh, people who are looking to protect, uh, sometimes it's protecting wildlife, sometimes it's protecting um, uh, backcountry skiing and you know keeping uh, their own place to themselves, but but uh, either way, um, you know what I feel. Uh, I'm a, again a huge uh, supporter of the environment in a lot of different ways, but I also feel like there's about 196 million acres of forest uh, in the country. Uh, even in Colorado, I think the number might be 20 million. I can't remember the exact number. You know the, the number of acres that actually ski resorts, any recreation actually takes up is is almost in, you know tiny. But I think for next season, um, Peak Six will be an incredible experience. It's going to be kind of like the Back Bowls of Vail, intermediate skiing, um, a really accessible to a wide number of people, and it's really going to help with crowding. So I think it's going to improve the guest experience, which really goes to the heart of what we're doing. On the summer side, um, everybody here knows that it's incredible to go up to our mountains in the summer. And actually, our mountains, Vail and Breckenridge in particular, are more crowded on July 4th than they are on Christmas. There are more people that go up there. But we don't do as much up on the mountain in the summer as we do in the winter because there's <laughs> no skiing. Uh, and so from a business perspective, it's been tough. But over the last decade, we've seen a lot of growth in things like zip lines, canopy tours, ropes courses. Uh, and we went to start putting those things on the mountain, found out that um, actually because they, they are all on fire service land, we couldn't because the legislation that was created for ski resorts about um, three, four decades ago, never conceived of those types of things. So we actually went through the process of getting a bill passed in Congress, um, which took us about five years, which doesn't sound like a lot until I tell you that in the first year that we launched it, it was broadly supported by everyone, broad bipartisan support. We had everyone from Bernie Sanders in Vermont to Ensign um, in Nevada. We literally, and Mark Udall, Senator Udall now, was, uh, was a huge proponent of it. And it was because, even though it was adding activities to the mountain, it was an incredibly environmental thing to do because, of course, we were using all the same infrastructure, the trails, the bathrooms, the parking, employee housing, all of that. So it was a real opportunity and a, and a, and a great chance to really create 
um, year-round economies, year-round employment um, and engagement for more people up in these mountain communities. Um, the good thing is the bill did just pass, uh, and uh, we're now going forward with adding uh, these activities, again, which will be all in the areas of the resort that we already do skiing and riding, so it certainly won't impact anything, but will allow us to leverage a lot of these things that we spend a lot of money on year-round, but haven't had a use for in the summer. Uh, I think it's going to be a big opportunity. The, the other key thing for us is when we, even though it wasn't required, um, our company decided we wanted our summer experience to be as iconic as the winter experience. So what we've done is we're going to intersperse through all of these different activities um, interpretive, environmental interpretive centers. And we've named this an Epic Discovery. That's going to be our summer activities plan, Epic Discovery. And it's because we want to introduce kids um, to the forest, just like you get introduced to the national park system uh, in the summer. Uh, and we think it's a great, we think, you know, the Colorado Rockies and our national forests are this incredible treasure. And we should absolutely you know, do what we can to kind of introduce the rest of the country to them. That's our summer. The Epic Mix program, I think, has been a, a terrific addition to the Vail Associates experience for individual skiers. Uh, a wealth of information personalizes your experience on the mountain when you go home, possibly when you talk to friends, you tie it into social media. Where do you see it going? What kind of new additions do you see happening with that program in the years ahead? Um, so Epic Mix, uh, for those who don't know, is great. thank you, by the way, great question. Epic Mix is a uh, program that we have. We, every single lift ticket that we sell has a little RFID chip in it. And as you ski, we track where you're going and all your vertical feet, the lifts you're on, without you having to do anything or without it getting in the way. And at the end of the day, you can go back, see where you skied, see how much vertical feet you had, and we give people pins on Facebook and things like that. We allow you to share it on Twitter. And then we took our photo business. If you go to one of our resorts, you see somebody in green, they can come over to you and scan your pass through your coat, take your picture, and your picture shows up on your phone. It's actually a pretty amazing thing. Um, next year, what we're doing with it is actually adding ski school uh, into Epic Mix. And we're calling it Epic Mix Academy. And what we're going to be doing is essentially every kid and everybody that goes through ski school, we will keep track, almost like a report card, of what you did, uh, what level you're at, what skill sets you have, and then we're going to put it into your Epic Mix account. And for parents in particular, it's amazing. So that when you go, every time you bring your kid back, our instructors at any of our resorts will know exactly where your kid is at in their development, what they have to focus on, what level they're at, and it'll all be streamlined. So it'll really help that process and it'll also give parents this kind of long-term, you know, almost album of their kids' progress. But for adults, we're going to allow adults to do the same thing, but it'll be, you know, on powder skiing or on mogul skiing, uh, racing. I mean, all kinds of things that we'll be able to give people this recognition for. And one of the things that we have found is that giving people recognition on Facebook is actually worth more than money. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I, to me, of course, when this first started coming out, and you're, I don't know, anybody here has heard of the, the game called Farmville, where, you know, you get virtual cows and, and, and livestock and, and feed corn, things like that. That company who does that, you know, makes, I think it's like $75 million a month on selling virtual cows on Facebook. <laughs> and it is kind of funny in, in, in one sense, but on the other hand, what we realize is, is that you know, having recognition and sharing that recognition, you want to call it bragging, you call it bragging, um, is an incredibly powerful thing. Um, and I, I think we've done a great job. I, my hat's off to our team on creating Epic Mix to tap into that, and in a way that, you know, doesn't get in the way of the natural part of skiing, which I think is why everybody comes. Hey, Rob. Um, I'm Nick. Uh, <laughs> hey, Nick. I'm a freshman here at DU. Uh, studying accounting and marketing, and would love to pursue a job in the ski industry. Uh, well, I'll, I'll interview you right after. Come yeah. on. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, like looking back, what you think the most beneficial path to take, um, like to getting a position like yours or like a summer <laughs> position in the ski industry would be? Like mine. Well, I would move to New York. <laughs> No, I, you know, what I'd say is for, if, if you do want to be in the ski industry or interested in our company, there's no question 
I would get up to the mountains and do some job there. I, I didn't do it. I did certainly ski a lot. I wish I had. Um, it's something that I don't, never got a chance to do, and I think it's a missing piece, actually, in my own history. And I would say that, you know, having some affinity or connection to the mountain, no matter where it is, at any level, I think is a great place, certainly, to begin. I would say that for our company, as you can tell by my talk, um, we put a huge premium on what your interpersonal skills are and how you will play in the sandbox. And I would tell you that, especially at more senior levels, the people that haven't worked out have been because, not because they're not smart enough or they're not good at their job, it's because they didn't understand what it means to be a leader like we're talking about. They didn't understand how to work together. And the funny thing is I tell everybody when I interview people, I say, hey, you know, people are always very accomplished when they come in, certainly to my office, and I tell them, everyone here is really nice. And people are like, well, that's awesome. And I'm like, no, it's not awesome because people expect you to be nice. And the funny thing is, is that, you know, that's like the kind of thing that flies over people's heads. Because, yeah, it's easy to be nice when you're up at Vail skiing. But when you have deadlines and people are down on you to try and deliver this or deliver that, and now everyone in the company still wants you to be nice, even when you have all this pressure, it's tough. So anything you can do to be nice. <laughs> There's one more here. Uh, as for future challenges, where do you see Vail and the ski industry going since uh, the 20 year pro projection and beyond for snowfall below 10,000 feet is pretty grim? So, yeah, great question on, on where does the industry go with global warming? Um, what I tell people, and I actually did write an op ed in the Denver Post, I think it was a, a few months ago, um, and actually was fairly controversial, though I, I don't know why, why it was. I, I am a huge believer in global warming, even though I think that term is kind of silly, believe. I mean, it, it's, it's not God. It's, you know, I think when I look at the data that's out there, I feel like it's a real issue and something we should be very concerned about. Um, I, but that's not because of skiing. I mean, at the end of the day, when you look at what people are talking about happening um, with global warming, you have huge changes to our food supply, to our ha natural habitats, to melting, to cities going underwater. Um, to me, I feel like that is a hell of a lot more important than skiing at Vail or Aspen, for that matter. Um, and so, I, you know, our company needs to do the right thing for our business. We need to absolutely, um, you know, act and uh, operate in a responsible way, certainly about the environment. But I can't really do much more than that. Um, and so, you know, and I would tell you that I, my worries, a lot of people ask me about that as a CEO. I say, you know, I don't worry about global warming as a CEO. I worry about global warming as a parent of a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old and what life on this planet will be like for them. So it's not a dodge. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the reality. And I, I, I think, you know, I certainly would encourage all of us to, one of the things, that, here's my, my small political speech. I would say, you know, that what I find funny about global warming and the way people react to it is that there's this huge thing about, well, is global warming um, actually happening or not? But that's not, I mean, at the end of the day, it's probabilities. Nobody really knows for sure. But if somebody came to you and said, you know what, your son, daughter is sick, 50% chance, 60% chance that they could die, but if you go on this diet, they'll be fine. What parent would say, oh, I'm not going to do that. It wasn't 100% chance, so I'm not going to do anything about this. And, and so to me, I kind of feel like, on global warming, and I certainly think that's true about our company, it's like, I, I don't know that it's a certainty what's going to happen, but you know what? There's enough people saying there's a problem, enough doctors, last scientists out there saying we have an issue. Let's do the right thing. Hi, Rob. I have a question about um, your previous experience with New York and maybe not being completely honest all the time, <laughs> um, but also now with being, not always voicing your opinion and being the quiet person in that maybe awkward space. One of the traits I most value in myself and in others is transparency and openness. So how do you kind of follow that line or how do you feel about that when you're in management? Sorry, I didn't hear the, you, you value transparency and open, see, openness and? Um, so how do you balance maybe that, that extreme with being completely open with maybe holding a hard line and doing what's best for your employees? Uh, well, I, th I think that's a great, that's a great question, and I, I do think that sometimes, you know, I tell people I really want everybody to be open, and I want people to be transparent and be candid, 
And then, you know, somebody says something, you know, totally inappropriate in a meeting, and you say, hey, well, you said that was not appropriate. Oh, I was just being transparent. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's what I was thinking, so I said it. You know, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think, you know, I, transparency and openness doesn't mean, you know, that, there's, that there isn't a, ultimately a place and a time for this. That, that the question is, you know, are you holding your values in a way that you can be? As a public company CEO, I'm not allowed to run around telling everybody what the company's doing and sharing non-public information. So there are rules. And I, and I do think, you know, sometimes people get stuck in this, Rob said to be open. You know, it's like, no. What I'm saying is, is that when the moment is right for being open, be open. Because what I find is, start with that. Forget about <laughs> every minute of your life. But when you're sitting across from someone who works for you and you know that they're doing something that's not right, I, I, you know, tell them the truth. You know, I, I tell people on my team all the time, you know, I would hope if I had mustard on my face that somebody would tell me. You know, like, like really? Like nobody's going to tell me? Well, if I'm not doing the right thing at, at work, like, tell me. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep doing the same thing over and over again like an idiot. So I do think, you know, to your question, I, I think you can meld those two, but yeah, there's a tension there, certainly. That's, that's a lot of pressure on the last question. <laughs> it's better be good. <laughs> I hope I pull, a lot, pull it out here. Um, Rob, you talked a little bit about the passion in your employees and, and, you know, what that does for the whole experience that everybody has at the resorts. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the role and importance of a leader in employee engagement and empowerment and mm -hmm. then how that drives the business and the success? Uh, great question. Um, and it's something that we have focused a ton on. Uh, I think it starts with um, asking your employees how they're doing. Uh, and so I think one of the things that people will sometimes talk about is, oh, we have great employees, our, our employees think this, our employees think that. But they don't systematically ask them how they feel, how they're doing. And so there's no real way to know. So I think it's now four or five years ago, I can't remember exactly, we started doing an employee engagement survey. We went out to our entire population and we basically asked them how we're doing on a variety of questions. And what I'd say is some of the questions we score incredibly well on, things like guest service, things like mission. Um, you know, on other parts, our relationship with our communities, not as good because there is a tension between us and our communities uh, that we're, you know, we're the big dog, right, in each one of our mountain communities and there sometimes can be tension. So it's harder for us to do better on, those, on some of those questions. But the key thing, though, is that we're asking people. And then what, what we do is we say, OK, fine. Now that we have all this data, I tell my, certainly starts with me, but then I tell my team, they tell their teams, go out and find out from all of these employees directly, what can we do to make things better for you? How can we improve, whether that's in your small working group, in your resort, in your division, or the company as a whole? And we take that, and we then plow that back into making changes at the company. One of the things that we scored fairly low on early on uh, was employee development. Um, that our employees, and I think this is unfortunately true broadly in the ski industry, typically had not had a lot of formal training or opportunities to try and bring people along and really help them in their career. And I would say that I think that's a critical, you know, having engaged employees um, is about making them feel like they have the right tools to do their job that they know exactly what the mission is that they're supposed to be following, and that they have a way to get better at what they do, to improve, to actually not only just improve in their career, of course, make more money or whatever it is, but, but it's just to feel like they are progressing, just like I talked about any leader or, or certainly the company. Um, and so we have, you know, I think, focused probably in the last couple of years more and more on how we can put resources behind uh, really bringing our, you know, our employees and giving them the opportunity. So if, there's, if you have a, somebody who's working in ski patrol, how do they get to be a manager? If they're a manager in ski patrol, how do they get to be a vice president? How do you get to move from a director to um, how to move resorts? How do you get to go to corporate? If you're in corporate, how, you know, trying to give people a roadmap so they can see their career and see how it could play out. But I would say that it starts with asking the question because you probably don't know um, what your employees want without actually asking them. Thanks.
I think we all want to thank Rob for the excellent lessons and leadership tonight. I personally want to thank him and credit him for an aha that I gained this evening. The thank you is that you credited your wife and your mother and your mentors for providing you with honest feedback. And that's great because we were the beneficiaries of that feedback and that candor tonight. The aha, though, is more personal. All those years that I was growing up in Wisconsin and saw those people ice fishing, I know now that what they were really doing was meditating. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. That was great. Thank you. You done? Okay. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate everybody for coming. <laughs>